I am being joined today by three women that um, I'm really honored to share the stage with. I'll have uh, one of them joining us here momentarily. She's actually Zooming in. She's very, very busy in DC, but um, Gwen Young is the CEO of the Women's Business Collaborative. And I think that it's a really great way to start off the day because she's going to share some astonishing data with all of us. I think we all know that you know, women have an uphill battle even to this day, but she's going to share data, she's going to share progress, and I think most importantly, she's gonna give us a little inspiration and hope. So that's a great way to start the day for International Women's Day. So let's get started. All right, hi Gwen. Hi Marsha, happy International Women's Day. There you go, cups up. <laughs> cups up. Thank you, first of all, for everything that you do to elevate, inspire, educate, and just collaborate with women. And I know that, we, believe it or not, we have 20 minutes to get all of this great information out to you today. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pass the mic and have you tell us a little bit about what is the state of women in business today? What are some things that we should know? So I think there's a couple of things, right? Everyone sees the headlines, you know, women are leaving the workforce in higher numbers. And while that's true to your point earlier, I think we wanna give some hope. So there's a couple of things going on. Um, men still outnumber women by a factor of four to one in business. But the good news is that women are 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs. So that's not very many, but it's progress because three years ago, women were only 4.2%. So they're rising, right? And they're about less than 25% in the C-suite. There are about 27% of women on boards. And so we're getting close to what we call this 30% tipping point, where once you're 30% diversity at the table, women at the table, we see the gains stay. We see more women coming into the table and into the workforce. So I think we're, we're seeing some stats where we're still not quite 50-50, right? Women Business Collaborative and many of our partners want parity. We want equity. We want women to be you know, in leadership positions in proportion to their, their percentage of the population. But I think what we're seeing is that those senior and the C-suite levels, women are rising. And as the move for corporate purpose and the concern for sort of community, talent, and brand, and de &I, what you're seeing is more women, more women of color, and a call for more diversity at all tables in business. We're talking a lot about numbers, like each individual women, woman on this planet. But I think a thing that still sticks out to me and that has in my opinion, along with diversity and inclusion, I think the longest scope of growing is 2% of women entrepreneurs receive funding from venture firms, et cetera. Um, I can tell you as an entrepreneur for a very long time that banks look at you a little differently. And while that is turning, you know, turning the channel a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that number, it's actually a little bit less than 2% and even that for women of color, right? So that is, that is a shocking number. And that's due to a couple of things, right? That's due to just biased criteria and bank and sort of venture procedures, right? Of sort of the criteria that you set being sort of biased towards women. And you'll hear a lot of women say, I bootstrapped my way up. I, you know, I got this on my own. I got this from friends and family, which is absolutely incredible. But, you know, we need to work on sort of the de bias procedures as well. I think it's the language, right? Women Business Collaborative just put out a, a series called The Fundamentals of Capital with Babson College saying a little bit of kind of learn the language because that will help both in terms of your ac applications and your access to capital. So I think what's happening is we're learning, right? The women business owners themselves, but also trying to work with the venture firms, with the banks and others to kind of look at your criteria and make sure that they're not biased against you know women and women of color. What I think is also interesting though, as you point out, is that at the same time, you know, Black women-owned businesses are the fastest growing demographic, right? And But they're still having that same issue where it's a lack of access to capital. And what we really need to work on is being able to kind of link the, the capital providers with the women-owned businesses, look at the language and look at their criteria and make sure that we can increase that access because capital is still given in the same way as you and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, at, you know, you kind of look next to you and look at your networks and say, who should I give money to, right? And it needs to be broader than that. Speaking of networks, I think one of the first steps just for survival as a woman uh, in business is collaborating with other women, um, mm -hmm. mentoring, and just it, congregating. And so totally want you to share more information about the work that you do ab through the Women's Business Collaborative and some of those offerings. Absolutely. No, thank you. So 
Women in Business Collaborative, I always say, is built on two pillars. So one is we have 83 of the leading organizations working on women and diversity in business. So think Catalyst, Committee of 200, 30% Club, 50-50 Women on Boards, ITSMF. We have all of these groups. And, and we all have the same targets. We're collaborating to aggregate research and best practices, and we're agreeing to work together. On the other side, we have the movement. And so we have almost 500 men and women that agree that equal position pay and power is important for women and for all women. So within that, to your point about kind of the networks and, and sponsorship is we have an ally of her program, which is men working with women, but women working with all women to make sure that we're all seen and we're all heard at the table. So when you when you come and be a part of Women Business Collaborative, you can come as an organization and we can all work on the targets and the reports. You can come to network, be a part of this movement and be really a part of, you know, today's International Women's Day. So we can bottoms up again. Right. But be a part of all of us agreeing to demand for more diversity and a seat at the table. Speaking at seats of the table, let's talk about the fact and I, I hate to be the bummer out here, but women are leaving the workforce in the highest numbers ever. I think a lot of us recognize that that was triggered over the last few years through the pandemic. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and what we need to do individually and what we need to do as women to stop the bleeding, if you will. Well, I think a couple of things. I think there's what the women can do, and I think there's what the companies can do. So women are leaving in higher numbers than ever do due to factors that have been around for a long time, right? So one is is work flexibility, right? Women are, you know, not only taking on more at home in terms of caregiving and unpaid labor, they're taking on more in the workplace. So that flexibility piece, which is what you hear from everybody, mm -hmm. but the ability to kind of balance both of those works. But they're also leaving, you know, they are, you know, almost you know, 50% more likely to have someone else take credit for their ideas, you know, to get promoted over them. So if you read the McKinsey Women in the Workforce study that came out last October, you realize it's also due to like, you know, I'm tired as a woman of not getting credit for my work. So what we say to companies is make sure that women and all women have access to your hiring promotion, de-bias your promotion procedures, pay transparency, you know, equal pay for equal skills, make that clear. We surveyed 553 companies on what they're publishing in terms of DEI, and we found about 22% of they're publishing their employee engagement surveys. And so that being transparent helps the companies, but also helps the women be able to go in and say, you know, I want that job. You know, many women are passed over because and given a different type of job. You know, I want that job. I want that promotion. Right. That's part of it. I always say network, as you were saying earlier, with women and other women, but also, you know, network with the men and work within the company. But be able to demand, you know, the younger generation, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, so there's a lot to say right there, right? But demand that 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 flexibility and that ability to, to get the job done and be able to work, you know, how, how you need to work to show up and be most authentic. So we just have a couple of minutes left of our precious time together. <laughs> um, what, what do you want to leave us with today? You know, I think when we come out with a panel with this name, State of Women in Business, um, you know, it's it's important that we we set it up that way. But what would you say is the state of women in business right now in your own words? So I always like to end with a call of action. So the state of women in business today is while women are leaving, they're actually coming back in different ways, either as consultants or so forth. So I will say we're at a tipping point. We are at a moment now where, you know, now we're managing as a business the employee experience. And so this is the time to be able to say, you know, here's the job I want to do. Here's the job I deserve to do. Here are my skills, right? And be able to come back. But what I like is for women is they're coming back and whether they're women entrepreneurs or they're consulting to the private sector, we have a woman in our network who has a PhD in trust and is working with companies on trust. They're going back into these companies and saying, this is how you do it. This is how you bring the best of everybody to the workforce. So I say to the women, let's go out and do what we know needs to be done. We're graduating 60% of college. We're entering the workforce equal to men, but we drop out really quickly. Let's, let's figure out the way that we can change the policies and practice in the workplace so that we can show up and be at all the tables that we deserve to be at. I am so glad you brought that up. Um, a, a staggering fact that you sent to me, which makes complete sense, and as I'm looking at the audience, I'm, I'm sure you'll bob your head too, 43% of women are burned out as compared to only 31% of men. And so while we do need to challenge the workplaces, our elected officials, and everyone around us, we have to challenge ourselves, wouldn't you say, to 
take care of you. And that might mean two minutes, because sometimes that's all you got. And then it could also mean, like, I've been setting boundaries up every Sunday, like, nope, not today. It's just going to be me and my dog. So um, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. And I would say a lot of the organizations and people we're working with, too, when they talk about how to advance in your career, part of that 25% of whatever training that, you know, you and I went through is self-care and wellness. It's how to take care of you. I had young students ask me this week, what do you do when you're burned out? I said, make sure you take an hour every day to do what is good for you, whether that's resting, going for a run, walking your dog, whatever you need to do, because you need to take care of you because that's the most important thing for you to be able to be successful in your career. And be sure to check out the Women's Business Collaborative, all of the different offerings and everything you all are doing nationwide. Thank you so much, Gwen Young, and uh, happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs> So you're stuck with me for another 10 minutes. Um, I have to introduce you to two women that are specifically doing so much in Nashville and beyond, I, I would say, in the state and also for the country for that mat matter. Uh, first up, and actually I'm gonna have them both come out at the same time. I'm gonna have Jennifer Rasmussen Sagan come out, uh, Chief of Staff of the Office of Mayor Cooper. We also have Joy Stiles, Council Member, District 32. So one may ask, okay, why do we have people in office? Why do we have elected officials here to talk about the state of women in business? Well, they go hand in hand, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Both of these ladies are extremely busy. I've seen them hustle, so thank you for being here today. Um, you know what, Jennifer, because I'd love to give you the, the first shot at this, um, can you kind of give us the state of women in office just at a very singular level right now, what's happening uh, in your office and around? Well, our office is pretty interesting, as you know. Yes. Um, I had the pleasure of hiring Marcia, um, <laughs> and um, uh, I'm very proud of our office. Um, uh, right now, over 50% of our office is women. Um, and um, it's very interesting in Nashville right now. Um, we're very fortunate that almost 50% of our women on the council are also women. Um, or um, almost 50% of our department heads and our elected official are also women. Um, but that's, that's something you have to push strongly for. Um, and um, I'm very proud of that fact. Um, I'm, I'm, um, it's, it's something that our mayor has pushed for. Um, it's something that I have pushed for as our chief of staff. Um, but you have to have women that know their worth. Um, you have to know that you are able to do the job. We have a lot of women um, that are very strong in our office. Um, we have a uh, Deputy Mayor Haywood, who is a very strong leader. Um, we have a lot of women in our office that have very strong backgrounds, and um, they lead um, by example. Yeah, and by experience, and I think that's why, too, as women, whether if you think you're political or not, it is important for you to go out there and make sure you know who's representing us at, you know, whether it's your district, whether it is your city, your state, nationally, um, you know, it all matters because we need to make sure that we're not only seen and heard, that we have women in place to actually activate those actions, and so super important. Now we got Joy Styles over here. Um, you know, I feel like we're dumbing it down a little bit by saying that you're only representing District uh, 32 in council, and I want you to share a little bit about that district, but I also want you to share a little bit about the work that you are doing to push forward women in arts and entertainment as well. So, good morning, thank you, um, and good morning to all of you. I will say one thing to piggyback off of what Jennifer started. Right now, we are over 50% of the council, women are. We had one council member step away, which made us, instead of 20, we're now 21, which is <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> um, and for me, my background is the arts. I'm actually the very first full-time creative to serve on council. So for me, the arts are critical. We live in Music City. Our creative class really is part of our foundation. And so... What I've been working on lately has been to create an entertainment commission for all creative industries to be able to rise at the same time. We are Music City and, and, and music has sustained us and will always sustain us, but we need to support our other industries that are here as well. 
So that's that's been my push, my, my background. I was a country singer here, and I was also an actress in New York. So the arts are the oxygen in my system. And you're in a really, really dynamic district, too. Can you share a little bit about like what you're working on as far as small business and bringing industry there? Because we see you sweating out in those streets, Joy. <laughs> you're doing the work. So you're just going to talk about all of my happy things? I mean, <laughs> um, So uh, for any of you uh, that are from Nashville, my district is in Antioch. And so I have the Hickory Hollow slash Global Mall in my district. And we're revitalizing that right now. So we're going to have an Antioch Performing Arts Center. I'm um, working on trying to get us a maker space. We're going to have innovation there, so life sciences. Uh, I would like to call it the Antioch Arts and Innovation District. Uh, it's revitalizing and changing the game entirely. And so one of the things that we want to have on site, and that's from the community input that we've had over the last two years, is to have co-working space. So we can have our entrepreneurs come in, work on their ideas, and test them out before they go out to get their own brick and mortar spaces and to get that mentoring support. No big deal, right? <laughs> and again, I can't say enough, this is why the state of women in business is so hand in hand with our elected officials and those that work in the office. Speaking of women in the office, you know, we were talking a little bit about disparities and barriers and, and burnout and, and all of that. Um, share a little bit about what benefits and, and you know, basically um, what we've adopted in the office for women. It's, it's a challenge. I mean, I think a lot of women have faced a lot. I mean, we talked about it a little bit before in terms of burnout and things that we, we encounter. Um, one of the things that we've passed recently is family medical leave. Um, it was passed for female employees, I think it was 2017 in, in Metro. Um, we recently passed it for um, MNPS employees. Um, and I think we've got to start looking at quality child care that's affordable um, because that's constantly a challenge. I know I faced it when I was um, a young working mom. Um, it's not inexpensive. Um, and we've got to continue to look at that. It's a barrier for a lot of working moms. So prior to you uh, being the chief of staff of Nashville, really, is, is how I would say it, you've had an entrepreneurial past. Mm -hmm. um, your family has had an entrepreneurial past. Mm -hmm. How have you brought that thinking, that entrepreneurial thinking, into your role today? A lot of it's all about empowering women and understanding where they come from and the challenges that they face. I mean, you, you have to be flexible, but you also have to understand what women as people face. Um, you constantly are looking at um, women as people that are going through life every single day. And again, it, it's, it's empowering them to be the people that they can be, whether they're a mom, whether they're a young woman, whether they are just um, uh, an everyday person. Um, and it's giving them the space to grow um, and uh, understanding their needs as a human being um, and encouraging them. Um, again, it's, it's, you know, we, we talked about it earlier. It's, we're, we're facing constant challenges, um, whether it's burnout, whether it's understanding um, um, that we need to be selfish in our own space and understanding that we need to take time. Um, and we're balancing a lot more, let's be honest. And um, uh, we've got to be who we want to be. And if we don't support each other, um, we're not going to get there. Most definitely. So we have just a few moments together uh, before you go and save the world with your capes. Um, I have to ask you, if you had to like use one word or a couple of words, you know, how would you describe the current state of women in business? Resilient. There you go. And persistent. Love that. Um, and and I, I kind of also, if you will allow me. Please do. Again, kind of piggyback off of Jennifer and say, I'm also the chair of the Women's Caucus on council. And so we are focused on legislation that enhances the lives of women and children here in the city. And so one of the things that we did last year is get money allocated for the first time to get a therapist for in-home and also daycare center providers. Because that's a lot. You're taking on kids and what's coming in from their families and making sure you might be going through some of those same issues yourself. Mm -hmm. 
So to be able to, to have a place to let all of that out so you can pour back into these kids is critical. And this year we'll also be uh, creating a, a budget request <laughs> for some more work that specifically is delineated for women and children. Eliminating barriers for one another is key. All right, Jennifer, do you want to end with your word for the state of women in business? I just I empower. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, we, we've got to empower each other um, and, and, and push forward, but we've got to do it together. Yeah. And we have to empower ourselves. I think sometimes speaking from frankness, that's been the hardest part for me is just, you know, empowering others is great and we have to do that. But if you're not empowering yourself, then it's game over. So with that being said, happy International Women's Day. Cheers. Um, thank you for joining us, Joy and Jennifer. Um, coming up next, we will have Robin Bass from Go West sit down with event industry leaders from around the country on our Women in Events panel here at Go West Experience. We will be right back. Thanks, y'all.